so I think you, you can probably tell um, I write blog posts uh, a lot. Um, sometimes they start programs, sometimes they start things like this. Uh, that's the sum total of my work. So uh, well done to uh, Martin and Cara and everyone else who has organised this today. It's amazing. Um, this is a brand new talk, and it's uh, the first new talk uh, that I have written in the last five years. So you can imagine, I've been at GDS for five years. Uh, I recently left about a month and a half ago. Uh, and I'm off to do some stuff to do with uh, bringing together city planning and land development in the UK uh, government later on. But uh, I've basically been talking about uh, design in the UK government for a long time. So this is a completely different talk. So I feel like I'm amongst friends. This is, this is my crew here. So uh, if, I, if there are spelling mistakes, just, you know, keep quiet and tell me later. Uh, <laughs> so hi, this is me. Um, I am going to talk about today uh, what makes a good service and specifically uh, why we need to start talking about it. Uh, because I think there is a bit of a dialogue in design, in service design particularly, where we talk a lot about um, making things better and we get very frustrated when we're in environments where not everyone shares the same understanding of what we mean by better. And so I think part of what I'm going to be talking about today is actually forming a bit of a narrative around what that means. Um, I'm going to start with a story. Uh, I'm going to start with a story of Audrey. Uh, so uh, this is Audrey here. Um, she is a eighth grade uh, teacher um, and she lives and works in New York. Um, she graduated in 2001 and like a lot of people who uh, graduate from college in the US, uh, she graduated with a lot of debt. Uh, $77,000 to be precise. Uh, she did a master's and an undergraduate degree. Um, and her loan, crucially, although it's provided by the Department of Education, is there anyone who works with the Department of Education here? Okay, no, all right, well, no one to fact check me. Um, <laughs> It might be right. Um, so it, the interesting thing about Audrey's loan is that it is owned by a company called Navient. And Navient, basically some people nodding, Navient have an interesting catch line. We enhance the financial success of our customers by delivering innovative solutions and insights with compassion and personalized service. Which makes no sense as a sentence. Like someone, <laughs> someone literally invented that like in a fever dream, you know, one day. And they're like, I've got it, I've got it, John, I've got it. This is, this is what it is. Um, so basically, the, the Audrey's loan is owned by this company, and every time that she wants to do anything with her loan, um, extend it or repay it, she has to speak to Navient, who are a private company. Um, and she, because she's a school teacher, she doesn't earn very much and she has three children, she tried to lower her repayments uh, several times. Uh, and every single time she tried to do that, she was told by the person on the phone to defer her loan, because that was the easiest thing to do. And she, so she deferred in, a t in total about eight different times. Um, and what was interesting is actually Audrey is uh, entitled to something called the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program. Some of you might know of this, some heads nodding, uh, which uh, seems like a really amazing program. Basically, if you stay in the public sector for 10 years and you make regular re loan repayments, a certain amount, I think it's 120 you get to basically write off the rest of your loan. Um, and so Audrey phoned Navian and asked to be included in this program. She was told by them that basically, you don't worry about it in 2017, because the, she hadn't actually been working for 10 years at the point when she phoned them up. So she called back in December 2016, and she was told that she wasn't eligible. Um, and the reason why she was told that she wasn't eligible was essentially because Navian have this rule, and it's a seven minute rule, where every single phone call that happens at Navient has to be under seven minutes, or you lose your bonus. And you can imagine the amount of money that people at Navient actually get paid is not a lot. So their bonus is really, really important to them. And the quickest and easiest thing to do for someone that doesn't require any form filling is a deferment of a loan. That is the only thing you can do with Navient to basically get someone off the phone as quickly as possible. Filling in any of the forms that she would have had to go through to be applicable to this scheme would have taken much, much longer. And so essentially, Audrey has been the victim of bad service design. Um, and what's really frightening about this is actually technically the service is doing nothing wrong actually. There's nothing illegal about what Navian have done and what they have done to probably millions of other people who are like Audrey, um, because there is no regulation of services. Not in the US, not in the UK, not in Europe. There is no regulation of the way that we provide services. Functional, functionality like Navian's seven-minute rule that means that you need to get someone off the phone. 
not telling the truth to someone, Navin not telling her about the program in the first place, that's not illegal. That's just the way that we work in services. Um, and now Audrey um, works three jobs and she will essentially have to wait for another 10 years before she comes up her own. 27 years after she graduated, which is appalling. Um, but, you know, this is in total contrast to the way that we treat products, right? In the UK, about 100 products are recalled every single year. That might seem like a lot, but actually you, there are some quite kind of um, interesting things in that list. And some of them are very, very minor. Uh, this is actually a, a, a kind of dump from uh, a government department uh, who release an open uh, kind of data set of all of the different product recalls. It's a small selection. You can see a lot of salmonella. Um, you can also see uh, a lot of mislabeling, date labeling, a lot of plastic included. Yeah, the UK seems to like including plastic. Um, and uh, this one particularly, which is my favourite, which is a Scottish product, um, it is basically a, a seriously melting pot, which the pot actually breaks when it's heated. Uh, so we have some pretty, uh, you know, kind of, I would say, low bars when it comes to product recall. If there's a tiniest hint that something might go wrong with a product, we recall it. Um, and some of you may know Victor Papanek um, wrote this in the 1970s, a really amazing book called Design for the Real World, uh, where he said that there are few professions more harmful than industrial design. Um, and I think, actually, this is now true, that actually there are few professions more harmful than industrial design, apart from service design. And service design is one of the professions that is more harmful, potentially, if we get it wrong, than industrial design and product design, because it's not just plastic in our products we're talking about. We're talking about people not being able to repay their loans, people not being able to work, people ultimately not being able to live because of our services. Um, and it's not just the individual users that are being harmed by bad services. Actually, if you look at what's happening with the way the teaching is at the moment, something like 1.2 billion people currently are, not, are in default of their, their student loans right now. Uh, and last year, there was a record in the number of teachers we didn't have in the US to be able to meet the need that we have. 80% um, of California districts right now are appointing unqualified teachers through a means of basically using short-term licenses. So they are teachers that are qualified, but they're not yet qualified. So they're teaching in our schools in California right now. Um, and the um, Oakland School Board um, actually said that recently the uncertainty of <coughs> pay is what is causing people to not go into teaching. Direct results of things like NABI and not being able to repay your loan because you don't get paid a lot as a teacher. Um, so what do we mean by a good service? You know, where we're thinking about something that doesn't do all of those things. Well, I think it's kind of very simple that actually a, a good service kind of breaks down into sort of three different types of goodness. Um, in that it's good for the user of that service, that you know, Audrey is able to repay her loan. Um, it's good for the organisation providing it. So Navian ultimately are a profiteering company. You can argue that that's not the right way of distributing loans, but Navian do need to make a profit, or at least need to be financially sustainable to be able to provide that service. So the service needs to be good for them, but it also needs to be good for society as a whole. And it needs to not create a world where we don't have enough teachers in the world. Um, and the sad thing is, is that most services have not been designed. Most services are ultimately a kind of product of an accident. Um, and the reason why, uh, the reason, uh, what we've done essentially to try and solve that problem is if you Google service design right now, this is kind of what you come up with. And it is a, I mean, aside from the terrible diagrams, uh, which just offend me, just visually, um, the, f the fact that what we have done with service design in order to try and fix that problem of accidental design is that we've actually just kind of focused on the process of design. We've said, okay, you can make those accidental decisions, but you need to do them in a really, really focused, kind of conscious process-based way. It doesn't matter what the decision is, just do it in the right way and it will be fine, um, which is not really kind of getting us to uh, the right point. Um, we even have two ISO standards for service design. I mean, look them up. They are literally nonsense. The first one at the top is actually being written right now uh, by a group in Germany. Um, so get involved uh, if you want to standardize more of the process of service design. Um, but I think really what we need is a definition of what we mean by good services. So um, when you ask people what a good service is, this is the answer they get constantly. It depends. It depends on the, on the service. You know, is it a, uh, a commercial service? Is it a government service? Is it something that is kind of 
uh, you know, where you're going to a luxury hotel and you're being greeted, or are you being sent to prison? Those are very different services, right? But there are some really basic things about all services that we all just take for granted. And actually, those things are not obvious to the people around us. Um, and they are things like being able to find the service. I know this seems really obvious to you guys, but being able to find the service is really, really important. And it doesn't matter if it's a luxury <coughs> hotel or if you're you know, trying to work out how to visit your friend in prison. That's important. Um, being able to use it for the first time without having to already be an expert in that thing. Looking at you, government. Um, <laughs> Being able to complete it from start to finish with no dead ends. So if you've got two-factor authentication turned on in your service and you lose your phone, dead end. Uh, if you aren't able to download a, a PDF if you don't have a printer, dead end. We are, our services in government are generally full of these sorts of dead ends. We don't even know that they're there. Um, but it doesn't matter what service it is, you need to be able to not have this. And like I say, these things are really obvious to us in this room, but they really aren't because this is kind of awesome. This, kind of awesome. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, um, this is actually a, 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 I think it's a Ministry of Justice service, uh, an internal one. I won't shame them. Uh, I can tell you which one it is. I can't remember anyway. But it, it, this is pretty exemplary of what an internal facing service uh, in government looks like. I'm sure you have many of these. Um, and if service design was so <coughs> damn obvious, if it was so obvious to make things good, this is not what we would end up with. Would it? Like no one who thinks that you know this is a good idea like would make something like it, it just doesn't make sense. So um, good services don't happen by accident. We all know this because we spend a lot of our time working on this, but it, it's worth bearing this in mind. Good services are designed. Um, and just as you wouldn't really expect a non-graphic designer to understand and identify bad kerning, this might be controversial. I don't know why we expect people who are non-designers to be able to identify the detailed problems with a service in the same way that we expect people to identify problems with kerning. Because, because we keep making stuff like that. You know? <laughs> so, just, yeah. Um, so, where were we? Yeah, and I think a large part of what's driving this is actually the, our approach to design. Because in reality, a lot of the decisions that get made around services are to do with technology. So what can we do? And we end up doing what we can do, which is why we shove up more and more things into our interfaces and more and more different kind of weird uh, aspects to our services. And actually, the role of design in that world is really about what things should be done. Um, so I think we need a common understanding of what we mean by good service design. Um, and last year, I, again, I wrote a ranted blog post. There's a pattern to this. I should really think it through. I uh, ran, wrote a ranted blog post about kind of uh, some assumptions that I had on uh, what we meant by good service design and shared them on the internet. Um, and I had, I think, something like 2,000 comments um, on this Google Doc. It's still there. Um, if you want to comment on it, um, please do. I'm still in the process of writing these, so uh, the, it's wide open. Um, and this is what we arrived at, uh, kind of six months later. 15 kind of things that make a good service. Um, and you'll notice that they are not rocket science. They are not things that will make your service amazing and beautiful and great. They will basically make your service workable and good. Um, and I'm going to talk about three of these things. We'll see how far I manage to get through. Um, and uh, I think the three that are kind of most relevant, actually, to the kind of scenarios that we have in government um, most often. So I'm going to be talking about making it easy to find, being consistent, and encouraging the right behaviours from users and staff. So first of all, uh, a good service is easy to find. Um, so government uh, is really bad at this. Right, um, and this is not just the UK government. Every government is terrible at this, uh, and you know, ultimately, it's because we are the oldest and largest service provider in the UK. Um, this is an example uh, of a, not just a man with excellent eyebrows, um, but <laughs> one one of our oldest services in the UK, <laughs> which uh, he, he is very aware of his excellent eyebrows as well. We've had a discussion about it. Um, uh, he uh, so they run a service called the Fishing Rod License Service, and it was established uh, in around the 1500s um, by Henry VIII to stop people from stealing fish from his rivers. Uh, not really the point of it anymore. Um, the point of it actually is to pay for all the upkeep of our rivers and various other things um, in the UK. Um, it's 267 years older than um, America's. Um, 
is interesting. Uh, but it's not the only service that we have in this kind of situation. We have 10,000 services of varying ages, not all, you know, kind of uh, 200 years old, but some, you know, probably on the average around uh, 60 to 70 years old. Um, we have 25 different departments who provide those services and about 500,000 people who provide them. And this is what our services look like. So probably very similar to services in the US in that they are a list of incomprehensible nouns that you would have no idea what they were uh, unless you knew what they were. Uh, and so if you were trying to start a, uh, a new school group, if you were trying to learn to drive, if you were trying to start a business, you would have no idea which of these was the right one to use. And I think still my favourite is the sheep and cattle tracing service, um, from, uh, which is called, def uh, sorry, called ARAMS. Um, I don't know, like government loves a pun, but clearly not the best way of labelling our services. And it means that we end up with stuff like this. So this is the performance platform from Gov.uk recently. And and at number eight, you can see that you, we have contact DVLA. So that's essentially the equivalent of the DMV. So they do driving licenses and road tax and vehicle um, safety, that kind of stuff. Which means that the eighth most popular service on Gov.uk right now is a phone number. Yeah. And that is not the bright, shiny, amazing vision of the future of digital services that we all had in mind. Um, and it's because our services were not designed for the internet. Our services were designed for a world that looked like this, where you walked into a government office and you said, I'm trying to start a business, how do I do that thing? Uh, and the person behind the desk helped you to do that thing. And that is not how services work on the internet anymore. So Google is the homepage to your service. Uh, it's the homepage to pretty much every service, regardless of whether or not it's a digital service. It's where people start. So if they can't find it, then they're in trouble. And what we have right now is a bunch of Google fails. Um, so really what we mean when we talk about it's findable is that good services are verbs and bad services are nouns. Oh, five minutes, I'm only through the first example. Oh, Jesus. This is, it's the first time I've done this talk. Okay? <laughs> we'll, we'll see how far we get through the next one. Um, so good services are things like learning to drive, becoming a childminder, getting a pension. They are not things like SORN, uh, charity letter forwarding <laughs> service, or the employer ownership pilot. <laughs> Funnily enough, because you wouldn't know what any of those things were. Um, oh, still good. So, um, yeah, let's just skip over these. <laughs> Let's go to the next one. Uh, now, principle number nine. Um, a good service is consistent throughout. Um, okay, so I have a story to tell um, about Tesco's. Um, some of you might be familiar with Tesco's. Tesco's is a supermarket in the UK, and they have done some really awesome work to try and essentially make their service more inclusive, including the ability to be able to use MX as a honorific. So I was very pleased about this. I identify as non-binary, so I'm like, great. Perfect, I can use Tesco's service. Um, signed up online, everything was kind of going normally. All the emails, various things were going to MX Lou Down, which is very good. Only got a phone call and uh, from someone uh, in their call center and who said, Hello, is that mm, uh, mm, Mrs. Down? Um, because that's where their call center is, right up there, outside of Blackburn, and that's where the head office is for the digital development of Tesco's. And no one had thought to brief the people in the call center what MX actually meant, what non-binary was as an identity, uh, probably the fact that gender wasn't a binary in the first place, um, and certainly not how to pronounce MX. And so now, <laughs> I have, every single letter goes to Mrs. Down, um, which is interesting because, yeah, uh, there we go. But the interesting thing about this, and um, I will explain why we have a picture of an uh, uh, IX football team in the 1970s up here in just a second, um, is that actually um, services are only as strong as their weakest link. So that digital experience, sure, that was great. But it fell down completely when someone phoned me. And then, you know, now letters are starting to come to me as Mrs. Down. It's proliferated throughout the entire service. And in a way, services are a bit like football. So football works in the way that essentially it takes many, many different people to get the, the ball from, sorry, soccer, from one end, <laughs> from one end of, the, of the pitch to their goal at the other end of the pitch. You don't essentially take one person and then score at the other end. And services are very similar in the way that it takes many, many different people to deliver a service. 
And we are only as strong as the link between those different people. So that service from Tesco is only as good as the person who was the worst, essentially. Um, And what's interesting is actually, uh, some of you may know the story of Total Football, but um, a very interesting kind of thing that happened in football in the 1970s, where a um, brilliant manager called John Michaels from Ajax in Amsterdam came up with a new format for playing football. And his idea was essentially, you should train every single person in that team in order to play any single position. So rather than having a format for that team, they should all be equally skilled. And he recognised that actually football isn't about superstar players, it's not about the account sign-up, and it's not just about your digital service, it's about every single thing working well together. Um, and so, as I said, yeah, services are very similar to that kind of situation in that they are only as strong as their weakest link. Um, but crucially, services are consistent, not uniform. You know, actually, if you have a service that is exactly the same to every single person under any single circumstance, it kind of feels a bit artificial. It doesn't quite work. Um, and actually, O2 kind of realised this uh, back in 2012. So, um, back in the early days of 3G internet, um, O2's uh, so O2 is a uh, um, mobile service provider, pretty much like AT&T, whatever, uh, in the UK, and uh, their broadband network went down for a period of 24 hours and it was complete chaos actually it wasn't quite as chaotic as this there weren't literally things exploding um, but because it was the first major broadband outage in the UK nobody had any idea what was going on uh, and you, as you can imagine basically people got very very angry on Twitter because also 2012 was kind of the time when that was what you did right it still is to a certain extent um, but after about sort of six hours the uh, team team who were running the Twitter account for O2 got really, really tired and essentially kind of handed over to an intern, a guy called Chris at the time. And, uh, and Chris uh, didn't know what the rules were for talking to O2 customers and he did not know that there was a pre-prescribed script that he was supposed to be giving people and so uh, when someone said this to him, he said, we still love you. Um, <laughs> And it just kind of kept coming, and I, 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 I didn't have time to put all of his amazing responses in, but um, he was a man of a great sense of humour, and the head of um, customer experience later said that Chris trod a very fine line, um, <laughs> <laughs> meaning that he probably got a promotion, but it was, or it was touch and go at some point, um, whether or not he was going to do well. Uh, but really, when we talk about consistency, what we're talking about is not giving people the same response whether or not things go right or wrong. Or, you know, at the very beginning of a journey, talking to people the same as we do when, you know, kind of, we've known them for five years. That's not what we're talking about. Because that's uniformity to your service. We're talking about consistency. So really when we're talking about consistency, we're talking about consistency across the user journey. So from start to finish, is do we recognise that actually, you know, this is the same service all the way through? Was it going to different departments in different ways? Do we even think that this might be a dodgy bit of service that isn't part of the service? It happens a lot in government. Um, is it consistent across different channels? So, um, you know, does Tesco actually refer to you in, over the phone in the same way they do in an additional service? Um, is it consistent over time? How are we actually able to make sure this service is, remains consistent and every single part of it feels like one journey over a long period of time as we change it? And crucially, is it consistent between different users? Because had Chris actually responded differently to some users and then responded with the kind of off pat reply to others, that wouldn't have gone down very well. So that's really, really important as well. And I am going to finish there because Carl has flashed up in one minute to me. Um, but I'm going to. Woo! I'm going to here. Uh, yeah, so. Um, oh, shit. <laughs> sorry. Um, there we go. Um, there is a book. Uh, you can read it. Uh, it is out in November. Woo! Uh, <laughs> I literally been writing on my own in my bedroom for the last two months, and so that's the most validation I've ever had. <laughs> and possibly the most I will ever get. So thank you. That means a lot to me. Um, if you are interested in learning more about this 15 principles of good service design, or if you want to tell me stories about uh, any of those things, or if you disagree with them, there is still time. I've still got three chapters left to write. So um, sign up here uh, for updates uh, on the book. Like I said, it is out in uh, November. Um, so yeah, thanks very much. <laughs>